The first, the first item is salaries and wages. Um, in the proposed budget, you have salaries and wages that are based off of the current contracts. We have union contracts for two of the unions, and the third is in the process of negotiations. Um, the currently proposed or being discussed amounts are what was included for that third one. Obviously, they're not here since the um, contract has not yet been, been passed. Um, however, they have been included in this. Um, just so you know, they were also included in the six-year projections that were presented. Um, so these are the same numbers that are carrying forward. Um, this also includes a COLA for the exempt staff that is the same as that for the DEA union. Um, it is 1.6%. It's the June Seattle C CPIU. Um, it includes step increases for those who are not at the top of their salary range, and it includes the longevity um, for eligible employees, and of course the special pay for those who are in um, public safety that have um, special pay items. Those have also been included in the projections. Then we have health benefits. And unfortunately, there have been some changes in this area also since the proposed budget and now. Um, they are budgeted based on the individual family demographic. So we take each person, we look at are they single, family, how many dependents, and then we project that out. Um, and this, AWC had given us rates in June for what they projected. And it turned out that the rates came in quite a bit higher than what they had initially projected. So unfortunately, that's included in, in this revised projection. So there is a slight increase. Um, let me rephrase that. About a $40,000 increase in um, personnel costs. So there's health costs that go into that. There's also l that was projected to come in at 2% and ended up being 13% for fire. 11% for police and 4% for others. So the 2% that we were, that everyone was informed by LNI, the average is the average, but unfortunately for um, governments, it ended up being significantly higher. Um, and that information came out very recently. Um, so those combined all together make about an increase of $40,000. Then we have the state retirement rates. That's another large portion of the benefits for employees. We have the PERS rate, which is actually fairly stable, only going up from 11% to 11.18%. And then the left rate, which is staying stable at only 5.23%. So are there any questions on these base assumptions before we move into any changes? These are just the base costs. for the entire state, and they sent out a notice to everyone saying, um, yeah, we're sorry, we told you it'd be about a 2% increase, and um, too bad, your uh, public safety is going to be a lot higher. That's really way, way up. Yeah. yeah. changes each year, it's a very flowing. Well, so statewide there must have been a lot of injuries. Mm -hmm. We can assume, yes. yes. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so on the second page you have staffing additions and changes. <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier for the um, budget hearing, there are some changes in human resources and um, the city clerk position. And I'm going to defer to Ted um, to explain on that. I just want to give a little uh, background because oftentimes council, uh, you don't get to see kind of the, the things that happen until it gets to your level. So as you remember, the, the staff gets together and the way we do it is I lock, almost literally lock them in a room and say, hey, make your staff recommendations. Then we, as if we discuss them, we bring that to the mayor who makes his inputs asks his questions, he prepares his proposed budget. And the reason I'm saying this now is uh, 
it's a, it's a very sensible question of why out of HR and, and clerk reducing it hours and adding point seven. But we know that they need extra help. And we originally, way back when, long before you saw it, we're thinking of adding just point five to there. But through discussions, looking at the schedule, looking at how things flow, looking at overlap, both the clerk and our HR analyst uh, said that um, it would be better, really, for this to be done for them personally if they could crank their hours back to 0.75 and hire 0.7 FTEs instead of the one in the 0.5s. And that is for basically for periods of overlap. So we get almost like the police and shifting, right? We get two people on duty, one off the not for the same price. So it, it looks a little odd, but I wanted you guys to know that um, we're not reducing their hours. This was a, a group decision. And they, Doing that for the good of the city and for scheduling. That's one way to go. Can I ask a question now? Or should I wait until you're done? No, no, no. Okay. Um, so I see where it says no non benefited, you know, but I see um, when I look at the staffing budget projection, there's a dollar figure of around $8,000. Is that for like vacation time? It's not for vacation, it's for um, Social Security. Okay. For Medicare, um, for L and I, um, okay. for those things that they're not benefits in the sense that they don't get medical insurance and dental insurance, but we're still required to pay um, Social Security. Okay. Second question is, um, you've got it at 0.7 FTE for the the additional employee. What happens if they work? extra hours. So if they work extra hours and paid at regular time, mm -hmm. um, they don't shift into being a benefited position um, unless they were to sustain that for a period of, I believe, more than five weeks. So if it's on a given project basis for them to fill in or to cover for vacation, it doesn't shift that status. If it were to be ongoing, then we'd have to come back to the table and have the discussion of changing the position. And I would just say, if you approve the project hires, we're not going to let that get to a benefit position. That is absolutely not the plan. So long before the five weeks come up, we would have to re re redo their work schedule. I mean, we just don't we'll have room to be at employees with benefits, unfortunately. That's what we're talking about. Does this get us, does the unbenefited get us into retirement DRS problems? DRS is included in here. Okay, so um, we're, paying. Okay. we're paying DRS on these positions. Um, we did some research with DRS to determine what levels, and we ran all different scenarios, and these do qualify for DRS, and it's been included in here. I can't speak for previous administrations, but this administration has always reached out to DRS, and we like everything in writing. Well documented. You have it in writing, right? Okay. Right. 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 Excuse me. Um, so that's the changes in the governance department and the administration. Then if we look at public works, as you remember last year, I had just started and we were discussing that second position in public works, which has not come to fruition. Um, and when we were locked in that room, as Ted said, we were discussing what, what do we need if we can't get the street and utilities manager that was proposed. And, and that had mainly to do with the lower amount of money that was not commensurate with what we were looking for in that position. What do we need? And one thing that had come up that you as council had proposed several times was a more administrative position as opposed to a supervisory position. And so what this budget is proposing is to remove the manager position and then add a public works clerk at the level of admin support in the union matrix. Um, and then... In the union matrix. Why are you looking at me? Gosh! Yeah, I remember that. I remember Thank you. It's, uh, I had an operational <laughs> input as well. Um, we, had this, we had this discussion before Mr. Zahn retired. I then took over public works for six or seven months. So I actually got to lead it. And I got a first-hand view and, and made a judgment call as to what was 
most necessary from an operation level. And you know, I've counseled my other guys, you're right. I mean, if you know the answer means someone to take the administrative burden off. Um, I confirmed that when Ms. Mudgett was here, she came to the same conclusion. So what we are really looking at in the world of municipal government, that position is called a clerk, not the city clerk, but this is a clerk who uh, provides admin support and they're very technically proficient with grants, they know how to run public works administration, um, and so subject to Mr. Lim kind of validating what the two of us <coughs> That's where our proposal is to, to take it down from the manager and make it administrative. And, but I do want to keep it on the key side. You know, I got to take it over and, and I've learned firsthand and you know, certainly not too, too proud of it. Uh, this is having to run it in the side of the town before. He's going to need to hide that. So this would then be, oh, I'm sorry, because I don't have stuff. So this would then, we would redistribute this out. If you remember last year, we had shifted where the funding was for the director and the funding for the streets and utilities manager. This shifts everything back so that it's spread back out and then it spreads the director and the admin position across all the different funds. And you can see that in the long spreadsheet if you chose to, to do so, where the percentages are. Um, that was as good a place as any to talk about it. Um, one of the things we're going to be focusing on next year is proper allocation of costs. So you are seeing the current budget as it stands with the current allocations. However, we need to accumulate data to determine where are people actually working. Um, are people working in the streets but being paid for water or are they working in the proper place or can we put everyone in one silo and then to distribute their salaries based on where they're actually doing the work. Um, this is an emphasis that the state auditor's office has. Um, we, so we really need to catch up before it catches up to us, basically. But we need to accumulate a lot of data. There's a lot that we need to do. So we had to, unfortunately, propose the budget the way it currently stands. And then you'll likely see first or second quarter, depending on how long it takes to pull the data together, a change in how we distribute the salaries and benefits. Um, so right now, those positions are distributed the way that you can see in your large spreadsheet. However, there is a good chance that that will change somewhat and we'll come back to you with the data to support those changes. So set it differently, right? As it sits now, when you're used to seeing it, you just say a, a public works position, you know, 0 0.4 water, 0 0.2 storm water, 0.4 general fund, you know, 0.1 streets, whatever the point you know, adds up to. Um, as Ms. Henry said, that's, that's not a good way to do business. More typical. Well, it's fine, but more typical for, for better accountability and certainly better transparency. It's better to have 1.0 in each of those areas, and then let's say the water person has to go mow the, the lawn at the park. And we've been doing this for about 12 months now, <coughs> all the hours, so we have the data now to make this work. But the way it should work is that water worker goes and does some general fund work, he charges back the general fund for those direct amount of hours and vice versa. So if the general fund is out there working water one day, they need to, they need to charge four hours to the water fund. That's kind of a difficult to thing to say. And that's where we're headed. And, and it's not, you know, it's not earth shattering, but it's very actually exciting to people like me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's this position called on call duty? Public workers um, have a pager they have to carry so that anytime somebody calls the city, no matter what, if there's a water main that's broken or you <laughs> see someone climbing on a water tower or something like that, someone has to be available to respond. So someone, each week someone is assigned and they carry it and they're paid $300 for that duty and no matter what time of day or night. Yeah, that's above and beyond the column for on call duty. That's correct, because on-call duty is a straight, it doesn't matter if they get called out or not, they get paid. Okay. Whereas the overtime on-call is when they do get called out. They, they, they can't do things that don't have, like drink or be out of town or things like that. So it recognizes the, the fact that they have to work somewhat, even though they don't come in. Plus it's in the county. They have to be, a they have to be ready to work. So I can retain your feet. Councilor Boyce. You're on-call. Okay. So that's Thanks. Um, 
just to go back to the point where the, the funds are divided and using um, water as an example, um, in, I work consultant work where I'm billing different programs that have different budgets and I tell them I worked in this last week 20 hours on your program, 4 hours on yours and 60 or whatever. Is that going to be distributed in real time where you're tracking those, those hours so that whatever the funds are remaining in water will be known? Um, somewhere like as a touchstone that you have X amount of dollars left in the budget. So that's the goal. We, we have some differing opinions in management as to how that's going to happen and um, we have yet to refine the methodology. Um, it is somewhat difficult to do it in real time without a system that can track in real time. And right now we use the lovely system of paper and pencil. Um, so it would take some changes in order to be able to do it in real time. Right, but it, it's not too dissimilar from the concept of accruals in a program where you know what your budget is for that, you know what's remaining. Correct. And what you really need is a trigger point knowing that it's danger, you really need to manage this Absolutely. budget right. amount at this time because you just triggered something. So um, I, I like that approach because it, it seems fair and I think it was always, um, I don't think it was anything that wasn't above board, but I always seem curious where if someone didn't get 0.2, that seems one full day is going to be dedicated of their work right. to doing some activity. And we all know that's not realistic, so um, I, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, the question I have um, under Parks and um, Public Works, I should say, is for the um, events coordinator, the budget for overtime is listed at 88.47, and that's six. 16% of the salary, but I, I think of my concern is that it is two to three X of other part, or people in that department and what their overtime allocation is. And it's about the same as what um, our fire department bills or is anticipated billing for the year in 2016 overtime. Um, so my question is, you know, why so high? And secondly, what fund would be paying for um, overtime for that position? Would that be Totally out of public um, general so, fund, or there are a couple couple pieces to that answer. The first the first question was why, and and basically the way that it's been done. Um, Amy Walker has historically performed above and beyond the call, and and she's been recording her hours, and and we're asking to compensate according to the hours that she's having to work. Also, we do not have a position in here for the recreation seasonal. Um, we'd like to gather data and bring it forward, but we do know at this time that it does take overtime. But there are also events that are paid for by um, the lodging tax committee, the lodging tax fund. Um, as it stands, with all the changes that we're making and properly accounting for things, those have to be accounted for in the general fund and then reimbursed by lodging tax as opposed to previously when it was just built out to the lodging tax fund. So you'll see that in there and then we're developing a methodology to bill those. So we're asking to track the specific events. They're not allowed to use comp time. It has to be cashed out as overtime. It's then put on a bill and that bill is sent to, well, sent to me, but it right. goes to the lodging tax fund to reimburse that. So there is a revenue side to that expense. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not completely comfortable with that definition in that above and beyond, beyond is a redefining of the position. And we're saying, well, it's kind of like we're throwing a bone out there because they're doing the sexual work. So as from a management standpoint, either one, we have to ascertain how, what the real time is to run an event and scale our events accordingly so that we're not paying overtime for events because we didn't budget it correctly. And we can't just dip into overtime if the position requires more salary. And then that adjustment would be made um, another way. But what, what, I, what I didn't like hearing about that is, well, above and beyond and works more, well, is it an hourly position? And if it is, then we're saying that it takes X amount of hours to put an event on. We need to look at our events because what we have is a budget for salary. And that's how much our events should cost from the management and the you're running of an event or a series of events, a year's worth of events. And I'd say, well, you know, it was so great that we decided to have $8,800 8, 
or a 16% increase in the pay for that position in the form of overtime. That's not good business practice because either we should be going back and looking at the position and saying, are we paying it correctly to begin with, or are we offering too many services that we can't afford? But just to say that we're going to pay overtime because that's what the real amount takes, that's our decision to say we're giving too many events and we scale back. That's our decision. That's not the decision of anyone else but council to make that decision. So I want to be very clear on that. So if it is above and beyond, the decision of council is to decide, well, we should take a recommendation of what that pay should really be, or how many events we really want to have, and how many hours are in real time it should take. And I'll be frank, I don't think the bookkeeping on the, 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 the formation of an event from, from the nut to the, to the oak is really well monitored here. So I can go back to you and say, well, show me all the data that supports that $8,000 that it really took 60 hours to do this event as opposed to 40. So is that accounting available? And I don't think it is, because I never see it. Yes, Ted, you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first part, above and beyond, historically, um, some of the positions around here, not just in recreation, <clears throat> kind of the only way to do business was um, you know, if I have to put two or three hours into the Saturday for a community event, I'm just going to do it and not take comp time or overtime or anything like that. Um, but, you, you know, you can't do that. You can't volunteer your job to the city. It's, it's illegal in this state. So we need to properly account for what's going on. Second, I completely agree with everything you said about we control the amount of events, we control the overtime. Um, there is a revenue source for this, number one. Number two, this is a projection. But most importantly, this really is the crux of the renovation review. We just start. You know, we've got the business plan. We need to look at all of our events and how that fits in with your objectives and your vision and how they don't. So um, this is not the end all be all here. Other questions or comments or else Kate can continue with the presentation. Thank you. So the only other point in public works is the um, seasonals. And we are proposing to continue with four seasonals like we have this year for a period of six months out of the year. So no change there. We're just asking for the, the same amount that we had this year. Um, and then in record, excuse me. Are they on your sheets here? They are at the bottom of public works, if I remember correctly. And they're in one line, and it says maintenance work for seasonal. And it's actually four. So in recreation, so we discussed at length the fact that recreation needs additional people to perform their duties. We also discussed the fact that there's been, um, that we need to provide more data before um, council appears to be comfortable with with adding those positions that we need. So one of the things that we came up with was that in um, finance and admin that we have one person, so the receptionist position that you may have seen has been open for some time and we've had a temp in there and it's because we're still trying to figure out the best thing that will work best for the city. And, and this really is a, an intermediate fix until we can figure out what recreation really needs. And we're currently advertising that position. I believe it closed today. And the goal is to have someone who will be front, at, be receptionist, but will also be dedicated to parks and rec. So in other words, that position would handle all of the accounting for the sports, sporting events, um, tracking for the, the coaches, all of that. But also, if we do have an event come up, um, the agreement would be that they would flex their time. In other words, they might work just in the morning on that day so that they then had the hours left without incurring any overtime to go set up the event and things like that. I've also talked to my team about options for those few hours where we can flex hours so that we don't incur any overtime, but that we can pitch in to help Parks and Rec to get done what needs to be done until such time as we can provide all the data that we need to, to justify what it appears that we need in recreation. So that position hasn't been filled yet. We hope to have it filled in the next couple weeks. And the goal again is to have it be that fill in for recreation to reduce that overtime. 
and just piggyback on that, just to drive this home. So we're not going to ask to have seasonal recreation until such time as that review happens, and until such time that you're comfortable that that's actually needed. And you know, it goes back to Councilor Forrester's last point. Until we do this review, until we look at our programs and look at the way we do business, um, we're not going to even ask for it this year like we did last year. We know there will be some admin duties that kind of fit with the secretary of the um, So, you know, in that regard, we, we can cover it for six months without having to add another employee. And, you know, when we do this in June or July, if there's a need and we we'll agree with it, then together we'll set it. If there's not, then we will change the way we do business. But I wanted to stress the fact that you know, we're, we're taking this off the table because we need to do the review and we need to do the examination of our business before we start adding people to the payroll. Any additional questions on recreation before I move on? How long were part of the, are the temp seasonal workers and the recreation temp? Or, that part time? Person, are they during the same season? So the season? we removed the part time um, recreation more, and it would have been my understanding is part time throughout the year for all different events. The, t the seasonal workers are sort of staggered so that they start, so they start when the grass starts really growing, and then they go through um, and they're staggered for when they start and when they end. That's our question. Yeah, it, along the lines of how we discuss water um, and billing and different funds, and I may again miss it, but are we going to do the same thing for museum and tourism? Because that is that is definitely something that needs to be tracked on. We know what what we're spending and what we're getting back. And and the reason I say that is, um, you know, just my personal, you know, just so people know, I'm on Facebook and do whatever they do. But I don't. I don't think there's a there there. I've always said that, so it's not a mystery. But I'd like to know how those funds are being distributed because these, this is like a well that we dip into, and now we have a salary on here that we're dipping into, and I look at the end it says general fund, and you know, 100% and it freaks me out, but um, at least for some of the stuff. But for the for the museum coordinator, um, they do worry about <laughs> that not being tracked because um, it's a split position between the tourism of the museum, um, I want to know what the payoff is because my personal point of view as, a, as someone representing the citizens is that this is, both of these are not city functions. These aren't things like water and police and fire that we have to do as a core to keep a community. These are the nice to haves that we've kind of always had, but these could be funded through a chamber of commerce or a charity or whoever wants to take over the historical society who wants to maintain that. And then they should accept the liability for that salary and the retirement and all these other things that you know come in, into that. So, you know, and they can go and manage those funds. And I, I know that we collect those taxes um, as the tourism taxes, but I, I just want to know if we're going to track that for future decision points because I don't know how long we keep going on and pretending that we're, we're adding value and showing value, I should say, to the citizens for having um, someone on staff to handle tourism and someone who is paid to curate a museum. And these are two places that we've historically had trouble retaining people. So in the 15 years here, I haven't seen a tremendous amount of growth out of um, the museum. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a museum. I'm just saying as a function of city business, it may be time to have that hard discussion on that we jettisoned that off from our palette of responsibilities and have the historical society or some other private entity take that on and promote it and, and really go um, and be successful. Because what you saw today at the meeting that we just adjourned is the council now dabbling in where um, a, a dog park should be, and that's not our job. That's the job of an agency that we have that's supposed to come to us with ideas of where it could be and bring us the feedback from the community. We're, we're taking the slings of arrow for something that hasn't even been proposed yet. So that's the same thing with the museum. If we're going to be in that business, we're going to bog down a council that should be looking at other issues and have neglected big issues in the past. So look, 
I would say that we need to get the data points ready to go into 2017 to say whether or not we see a museum and tourism as a salary or as an entity as a city activity and then maybe we, we part ways with that. And from a budgetary standpoint, but not from a practical standpoint, they would still exist, but our interactions, us discussing it, would go away. And, I, and that's what I would lock in my fellow consonants is think seriously about, is, is it core to our business to be in the city of DuPont and, um, and, and think about what the liabilities are attached to that. So as far as, there, there are two different pieces to that. <clears throat> The first is that, um, so the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee will be meeting again on November 2nd, <clears throat> which we don't normally do this time of year, but we wanted to regroup because we're making a lot of changes on how we account things for things. And one of the items that is up for discussion is how will we account for things that are submitted for reimbursement. And one of the items that came up very specifically was the museum tourism position and how are we accounting for that and how are we tracking the hours. And that's, so that's going to be up for discussion on um, November 2nd. Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. As far as the council's role, any of the um, expenditures from the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee do have to be approved by council by law. So it's not it's not something we can get rid of. We could get rid of the salaries piece, absolutely. Um, but as far as the overall arching, um, we can't get rid of that. It being in the general fund is new. It has not been in the general fund before, and that may be what looks different to you. I think you may have not been here on the, the evening when we discussed it. Um, so in order to comply with state law as far as the accounting for lodging tax funds, we need to expend the funds in the general fund and then bill the lodging tax fund as opposed to expending them directly from the lodging tax fund. So that's why it looks like things are 100% funded in the general fund and really they're funded by the lodging tax fund. Um, the museum piece is slightly different except that the same person being doing both. If this person is required to account for all of their time for lodging tax in detail, that will include accounting for the museum work in detail. And so we should definitely have the data to bring forward to justify or not justify a moving forward with the position at the end of next year. Okay, and an option is to do away with the LTAP. That's also on the table too, because we as council created it, we can as council decide that we don't have a there there and stop managing that and let private entities take that aspect of tourism over <coughs> and then those monies won't be collected. No, but they can't collect the tax, but they can manage a tourism well, council without that funding. So we created the, the mechanism for, for them to get taxes. I understand that we have to approve on that. But what I'm saying is the LTAC is a decision that we should just assume is bringing in visitors. We need to have data to prove that it's viable, that it's worth accounting time. Are you billing accounting time back to LTAC for those those hours that you manage those funds transfer? I don't think so, right? So Not currently. Yeah, so I mean so there's monies that we do spend on a general fund to manage that that's overhead. And so that all has to be on the table and, and just discuss whether or not there is something there. Do we give it another three years? Or you know, just put a timeline on what we want to see out of it. And then that way, we put a little bit more intelligence into when we approve things. And I, you know, I have no qualms with what was approved in uh, the meeting last month. I saw that, and you know, I, I kind of just shrugged my shoulders because everyone knows my opinion on it. But um, the viability of it long term, that's, that, we have to be honest with ourselves on that. And if it's not going in the direction where we think we're getting enough notoriety, in the positive light, or we're getting visitors, we're getting repeat visitors, we're getting exposure in, in local, state, and national media, then we have to do a reset. And that's what I'm proposing. So that's, but that, that data is going to be very important. That's where we're starting. I, you know, I understand that I heard you saying, what kind, of, what kind of a time frame do you think that program should have a chance to prove itself? How many years has it existed to date? No, I don't think so. Actually, I don't know. Six. Just before I mean, we go completely down the museum track, yeah. I just want to make sure that we're focused on you know the the, the topics at hand. I think we all we 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 can all agree that the, the the issues that you're raising up are exactly.
exactly why we're having this conversation. They're part of the changes that we've been making. They're not going to be made overnight. They're getting more data, making more informed decisions, asking these questions, and having the data to back it up rather than doing it on a feeling or an exactly. obligation or you know the thing I hate. Well, it's the way we've always done it. So I think we're all on board with that sentiment. I know staff does. I'm sure all of us are we're coming unanimously around the table. But, but Kate, just to refocus us on the on the issue at hand and the questions too. The next issue is the museum and tourism coordinator. So moving on. No, literally the next is because it was we had said that at the end of 2015 we would discuss whether that position was going to continue into 2016, and so it has been included in the proposed budget, and that really is the next item for discussion. But if we've covered it, we can move on. That's where we're guessing. I have a question. Um, we're just talking about the positions, not the rest of the budget associated with that department, correct? Okay. Okay, so in, oh, sorry. Yeah. On that note, um, again, we're going to kind of turn this over unscripted to me on November 17th. So please, if you got something in mind, fire off an email. That way we can be ready to answer yeah. questions. But that's a good point. Yeah, to help, to help staff be prepared for those questions that you may have, not related to the public. Shortly, this will be one of the things <laughs> that you guys want to know, and any advance notice would be much appreciated. Because I had asked for things last year that I never got. We're going to try to fix that this year. Well, I mean, a list of successes and what we're doing to grow the museum and tourism and what we're doing to promote the city, and I never got a list. I think the tourism coordinator would be able to bring that list together. I, I don't think it would be too difficult to give me a list. Uh, if you, you want me to send an email and request to what I would like again? Yes, and I do remember there was a conversation that we facilitated with the volunteers that that request would be made of, and we can also facilitate that conversation with the volunteers and also the staff person that's there as well. Okay. So in FIRE, we're not requesting any additional positions, but we are um, proposing a slight change in duties, and this involves allowing the FIRE chief to respond to some calls in order to reduce the overtime. Uh, there was a there's been a significant amount of overtime um, in fire, and by allowing the chief to cover just when the, the rover, what we call the rover, it's the, the 11th position that's not assigned to a ship but that fills in when people are on vacation or things like that. Um, but occasionally there are things that come up, like a bereavement leave, somebody has to have knee surgery, things come up. Um, and so by allowing the chief to cover 12 hour shifts, he wouldn't be covering 24 hour shifts, but 12 hour shifts, and then there's an extensive agreement to that, but to help reduce the overtime, that has been considered in the proposed budget in order to lower the overtime costs. And some more background. You know, when we had to revise our revenue projections down by 400000 I had this discussion with some of the union leaders, so I want to have this discussion with, with you as well. I mean, you certainly deserve to hear this. Um, in a perfect world, had we get $400,000 back, one of our first drafts, even, even before the mayor saw it, was um, rather than having the chief go on those, those calls, which I was you know, pretty straightforward, I'll say it again, that's not the way we want to do business. We have looked at overtime, and the lines have crossed, meaning it was going to be cheaper to hire someone than to pay all that overtime. So in the original budget that you've never seen, just the staff just kicking around, we really wanted that uh, extra firefighter. But due to the four hundred thousand dollar downward projection revenue, the benefits that come with that, the startup costs, things like that, doesn't make it feasible. Uh, the other thing we, we would have liked to have had had we the four hundred thousand was another police officer, not just fill the vacancies, but add another one um, with the reorg and the business plan. They've got a different command structure, so the police department ate the um, backfill by creating a new lieutenant position without being a, a patrol officer to fill backwards. Now, operationally, we talked about the public works manager and the recreation specialist, but those are also the money savers. So that's kind of four big things. If, if we had $400,000 more, um, I'm not going to speak for the mayor, but staff would have advocated for full, full up positions in, in governance, and we would have advocated for an extra police officer, an extra firefighter, um, and operations.
obviously there's we would have downgraded the public works position anyway in the right position that would have been moved because we had to do the review. So I just want to give you kind of a what if if we had another four hundred thousand. That's what staff would have advocated, but it really is a move move point right now. This is how we solved it by kind of having the chief going calls just for one year. Questions, Council? That's where we're at. Excuse me, the next one was the big one too. We, we took, we are proposing, the mayor's proposing taking out the, the other plan. That's a, that's a huge money saver as well. And so we want to keep it. But finishing the public safety conversation fire. Any, any questions on that? I just felt like you were returning my Christmas present after you told me what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so in community development, um, we've opted to leave the senior planner position unfunded. Um, this doesn't mean that Nicole doesn't feel that she could significantly use one. It just means that, again, we're trying to, trying to fill that gap. Um, we're trying to cross-train and bring up some of our admin staff um, to do some of that work. We have a position that, that does have some of the permitting requirements in the job duties, so we're moving things around, we're shifting, we're cross-training, we're trying to fill the gaps where we can. Um, but that position has been left unfunded on the 2016 budget. Any questions on that or comments on the community development piece? The other thing I just want to emphasize, Council, is, and this does not just to reinforce kids' point of, this doesn't underscore the, the need. Um, but, but I also just want to bring to your attention, you know, the, the intentional effort that we made to recruit and hire and vet a different caliber of staff. And, you know, the, the leadership team that is here is, is phenomenal. And they're capable and they're doing some wonderful things. And I look forward to what they will continue to do with the department as they get their feet wet, as they get up to speed, as they come in like Katie has and ask the tough questions. Like, why do we do this? This doesn't make sense. Um, and I would just ask that, that you continue to listen to them, to trust their expertise, to trust them asking these new questions and looking at the ways of doing things differently. Um, you know, hold them accountable, but, but empower them also with the resources to move in these new directions that they're doing because it, it is a different DuPont. Um, you have an exceptional staff and, and they will need to be resourced accordingly, like looking at the, the needs of the government's budget, things like that. There's, there's needs across the department from a staffing perspective. Um, that I think need to be <laughs> as we continue looking forward. And the final piece in the personnel is in police, and it simply assumes that we fill the positions that are currently empty. Um, and, and the reason is that we, we've addressed all of the positions that are empty as to whether we're recommending that they be filled or whether they we're recommending that they be changed or um, that they um, remain unfunded. And so for police, we are. Um, the budget includes both empty positions being filled. It has one lateral and one um, entry level um, are the way that the budget is proposed. There is one thing that's not on here, and I feel like I should point it out. The empty. Oh. Um, we have um, proposed a half of an FTE stays empty during the year. And the reason is that we're trying to budget as close as we can to reality, as opposed to building in a bunch of cushions and things like that. Historically, the city has at least one person, one position not filled at just about any given time. So that is built into this personnel budget in the general fund. You see it here in um, police. That doesn't mean we're expecting it to happen in police. It's a placeholder, it's a savings, it's a half of an FTE that is in there. So if you're looking at the FTEs, that does show as a line on your personal budget. I didn't get that. No, but I, I want to reiterate what we talked about at the late study, uh, and that is you don't see the additional personnel in this budget because at least from our standpoint, that's a heck of an assumption. You know, I, mean, I felt like we painted you guys in the corner. So that's a separate conversation we're going to have in the first year, um, as we said before. But I know one of the citizens brought that up tonight, so I'm reiterating. That's why it's not in this budget. That's a, that was a really big need, and it required you guys to win on the rate. 
as a lot of the folks are talking about people, buildings, things, drugs. And those are discussions that happen individually as they come. Any other questions, Councilor? Councilor Rossi. How do you do with the, the data collection? Is the collect going to be involved in that? time to evaluate uh, these uh, positions and the amount of time and all of this. And if so, how is that going to fit? Are, are you feeding in the, 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 the data or, or are, are they going to ask you for that data? Is there can we do an overview of sure. data collection to satisfy the concerns so that council can use that data in, in order to make decisions in these various areas. Absolutely. But our, our data is going to feed into it. It's going to not only be available for council, it's going to be available for the general public. The whole, public. That's the whole premise of doing this is, and, and, it's, and it's forcing two things. I mean, it, this is consistent with the, the performance management, performance government approach, but it forces us to track and compile better data. Because candidly, when we started this with public works, we were tracking way too much and not doing anything. So it's going to help us focus on the right amount of data, and then it'll feed into a system that'll make it publicly available. Well, that process is very important, I think, and, and ties in with uh, a date by which it's going to be available to council so that a council member who these questions and concerns uh, uh, can be looked at from a, a data standpoint. In, in order to evaluate. So, are, are we going to get the comment a year? No, so, so what's the timeline? Right, so let me, let me just manage expectations a bit. If you remember, we're rolling it out in public safety and public works. Right. So, so, police fire, water, and stormwater, uh, and the exact order of those four is police shortly thereafter fire, some sort of delay in public works. The first amount of data is in, we're talking in, in, in the time frame of weeks. So certainly, uh, Socrates told us by the first year we ought to start seeing stuff up and being able to use. So I want to manage expectations. So the short answer to your question is no, it will not help Councilman Gorski's question because we don't have Socrata and the new performance measures and things like that slated to go citywide. That's going to take us a couple of years. We don't have the bandwidth around here to take undertake that all at once. We're going to have to face it in over time. So the short answer is no, but it's coming. And where that fits in really is, is, is a discussion we'll have to have probably after we get the first round up. We were thinking at a staff level we might hit finance next because we're already in a lot of local gov. It's a pretty neat tie-in. Um, where we go from there, and we can have a workshop at some point later in 16 and talk exactly where you guys would like to see it because there's really no set roadmap and it's not dependent on each other. We yeah. really go in any direction. The reason we started with public safety is because of the, the budget impacts and, and the importance of public safety data. And in Canada, when we looked at how we could expand this, public works was the next fit because you know, I've been talking to Peter about this since I got here and it's just, it's been a painful process. And, now, with, now to give Gus this gift of trying to force this information, this data collection, um, so that he can at least have a, a tool to manage and bring some reason to this would be helpful. But it's not going to happen. You're not going to have all this in time to make the budget decisions that you're looking for. Those, those are the four, by far, four biggest budget steps we have. So why not start there first and figure out and get our handle on what's going on and where we spend most money is kind of like blind thought. So, so how do we progress from where we are now uh, to getting that data down the road uh, in a couple of years? I mean, what, how are we going to be able to respond to these concerns? Uh, what's, what's the criteria for, for the, the data collection now in order to provide a certain degree of uh, answering to these questions. Uh, and are we talking about a specialized group of individuals here around this table that are going to identify, hey, these are the areas in which we need the data, the data, or, or how?
how are you going to progress in, in, in this operation? I mean, now and when Sukhan right. does it at a professional level and we're able to perform it on that. Well, right now, within the, within the last 12 to 18 months, we really started citywide collecting data. Uh, another reason with public safety is because, frankly, they do the best job of it, and then with Southside 901, it's very easy to translate that into to be able for us to use it. But we are, even if it's down to paper and pencil, right? So over the last 12 months, all of our public workers are inefficiently filling out an Excel spreadsheet to track time. But we are tracking it, so we will be able to use it. But like Katie said, well, like Ms. Henry said at the state auditors, you know, we, we've got a lot of information that we just, we just can't use. Um, so we have, you know, we use the paper and pencil and stuff, but, and being able to analyze it, being able to make sense of it, that's what Socrata brings. So you know, we can have the museum tourism discussion. It's just not going to be as easy for us to, to bring it up. And, you know, it's not anything we could post on the website. We, we can't really want to put, you know, 52 Excel pieces of paper, you know, photocopy it on the web. So, that's what Socrata does. It allows us to use the information we already have. So my main point is we aren't collecting it. We're doing a much better job. It's just right now it's not being centralized and we're not having uh, outside police and fire. Can't, I'm just saying what we're going to do street. They do an excellent job and you see in their reports. I'm talking about over here. I'm talking about what you're asking. That's what we're talking Katie, when I worked as an auditor, Probably similar to your project accounting, we had to fill out an online timesheet. We had a, that we had to say what audit we worked on, which client we worked for, and that basically tracked our time and our billable hours to that client. Is our is is our soft, payroll software? No, you're you're laughing. See, our payroll software doesn't have the capability of tracking the time like that, does it? It it does not. Um. Is there some the software, expensive software we can get for project management and project? It, it was in that, that nice budget that had to be scrapped because of lack of funds. Um, it was a priority. Um, we know it's a priority. We had started going out and looking at quotes. We looked at a few different systems. They were great. We were excited. And <coughs> unfortunately. I, I've had some experience with that one was uh, Henry's talked about because the whole financial software system needs to be redone. That was part of the nice budget. But to answer your question, there are some reasonably priced alternatives out there that we could use for a you know, three to five year horizon as, as we build up money to get this. And it has to do, it's very similar to what all our service companies, Comcast, uh, uh, AT&T, and anything else. There's, there's many dispatching programs. So when the technician is sitting outside your house, <laughs> He's still on his computer and in the customer service slash dispatch program. It's all being routed. It goes to finance and gets tracked. So that to me is our next logical intermediate step, especially because we've got that grant score water. Uh, a lot of our utility workers now have the tools to be able to utilize something like that until you know, six months ago. We didn't have the hardware to do it yet. So we are looking at some interim solution beside the side of that can interface with the accounting system. 
And then comes the question, if we have an accounting system that is fraught with issues, do we really want to pay for another system to interface with something that already doesn't work, or do we want to wait a little bit of time? So I believe that's a much more extended discussion that needs to happen, and we can do some research on our end and, and come back to you, but we took it off the table because we, for one, didn't have funding, and for two, we ran into some issues with, um, with our current accounting software. Yeah, it's not a budget item for this. Well, yeah, it's like, it's like I'm kind of wondering if there's something that's like, mm -hmm. cost peanuts, you know, the, you know, you're going to have like, 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 salary. <laughs> 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 December paycheck, we had some time keeping software. Yeah. <laughs> 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 council member reports. Council member reports, we got um, a busy minutes left. If we had the money, how much would it cost? We're good. Good system. For a good system, I would say between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. Okay, something to know. But that's a really good system. You could get it for cheap. Have you ever prepared for this? Right. Please, please don't do that today. Please don't. Back off. That's. Please don't say something. Just say you told us it's fifteen thousand. This we're just. Oh, I just just wanted to have some idea. I didn't know if we're talking three quarters of a million dollars or seventy-five dollars. Is in some framework. Other questions, Council? Okay. Council Member Reset. Yeah, I just want to make sure that when I go home and do my homework before we have this next meeting, that I'm not uh, making some false assumptions here, but I'm looking at the September. I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the September, I'm looking at the September handout that you gave us in the packet and I was no, I was noticing in there some of these expenditures since we're a third of the way into the fourth quarter in light of the personnel discussion that we're having. Um, I just had some questions about where we are with the budget. Now I'm not saying that this should imply like back in the army days where it needs to get spent, but I'm just wondering as a tracking mechanism. Uh, it seemed curious that the museum was up to 1% extended. Greenways was at 50% approximately, and then, you know, the mayor and the council were at 45%. So I'm, I'm just saying, how does that relate to the budget conversation that we're having? Here? So there are a couple, a couple things. One is that that budget there does not include the adjustments that you just approved this evening, which are going to decrease those budgets. So the next one that comes out will have the decreased budgets based on revised expectations and savings that we have been counting on. Um, so it's going to look a little bit different. Um, in the museum, we had an empty position for a long time, and that explains it. Um, in council, um, in the governance area, there were some extra funds that we're still waiting to determine whether those will be used or not. Um, but again, the big thing is once this budget amendment is passed, you'll see a significant decrease in those budgets, um, and they'll, they'll look much closer to where you'd expect it to be this time of year. In Greenways? Um, Greenways has to do with the, if I remember correctly, the budget for the parks irrigation got erroneously put into the Greenways budget. Um, so there was a variance there. So I'm assuming that the parks irrigation is closer to high, although some of the parks didn't get turned off until later in the year, as we all noticed. Um, so that's mainly related to that. But there is an adjustment in there, if I remember correctly, related to the True Green um, contract that's been decreased. Other questions, Council? Other clarifications? Thank you. Anything to add? Yes, so before we adjourn, if there's any way that you can send me any questions, any comments, anything, um, as we go forward, because I'm trying to accumulate the numbers, and there's, there's a lot of work that goes into all of the spreadsheets that we put together. Um, and I remember last year we came to the last minute and I was trying to change spreadsheets, and nobody ended up getting the, um, the actual full budget. So if you do have questions, and I can, I can even run different scenarios so that we can come with, if we do this, if we do this. But if I don't know the questions ahead of time, it makes it a little more difficult. So please feel free to contact me. Help us help you. That's what we said. Yeah, I mean, since the department heads are sitting here, I, if they have anything to say, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts.
thoughts on this. I mean, a lot of it sounds like there's been go round and go round of conversation uh, that you guys have had time so so as to you know you've eliminated things, you've prioritized working your own uh, departments. You know, I thought it was interesting, Katie. That's a good question. What would it take to get what you want? So it like be, I'd be interested in hearing what it was that fell off the table from your budget, perhaps in those behind the scenes conversations, or how you feel about what you're proposing here tonight. Probably like uh, the rest of the department heads would like to have more money to do more things, like the council mayor. But uh, all in all, I think the discussions we had were outstanding. There was a disappointment um, once we realized how much money we didn't have. But um, speaking strictly for the police department at this point, I feel pretty good about this budget. I think um, the information that was given tonight was very accurate by both uh, the mayor, by the city administrator, and by the finance director. So I think we're doing the best we can with what we have. And the thing that fell off our plate was that 11th position to be a second roving firefighter. It would have helped immensely with uh, maintaining three people on shift without creating overtime. And at times it would also give us a fourth career firefighter. Because there are some months where uh, there are days that uh, there will be four with that 11th person. Um, with our compromise, I believe that's going to help significantly with keeping the temp and then having me pull more 12 hour shifts for this next coming year. Um, I'm also excited about that we're funding our equipment replacement program adequately, um, especially with some areas of our self contained breathing apparatus. That's a new thing that was put in for our replacement funds that are going to be due for replacement in five years. So, you know, the fact that we're doing that is very encouraging, and I appreciate the council for looking to that last year and, and making the decision to fund those uh, replacement programs for our equipment. Because it's really needed. We didn't make investments in that in our department for a number of years. Because our expectation was, as you realize in the past, that we worked several years to try to pass a, a levy to give us the funding. But uh, because that failed, we weren't able to make those investments. But now that we have the ability to to invest in it. I'm really happy that we're able to continue moving forward as a fire department with that equipment. Just in the future, hopefully, we can add personnel. Let's open it up to other staff there so everyone has the same opportunity. You guys can feel free to use the portable microphone too if you want. I mean, it, it, Katie really showed it pretty well. We're not going to have another planner next year, and I think that that minimizes the amount we can get done. But if you look around the table and see across the board, everybody's had cuts, and everybody, every department is really, I think, doing the best with what we can. And it seems like a very reasonable approach to move forward. I'm just going to say, and I like to. The council meeting, so I was kind of hesitant, but um, I felt it's important to say that I want to see us do a better job of um, being proactive with the HR department with risk management, um, dealing with personnel issues, career pathings, other um, items I think we can improve on in the future. So, something to talk about down the road. It's an option, you know, it's not I have to, it's a want to. Hi, good evening. I'm still a new guy. Uh, the, um, still here. Uh, good evening, I'm still a new guy. Uh, my short time frame here, The one of my concerns is what's already been addressed already, where staff is essentially spending time appropriately. Uh, I got something of suspicion as we dig more into it. Uh, the places that we're, you know, we already have funding in that we're probably spending in the other places where it shouldn't be. The other aspect is the challenge I have is I know we have a lot of cap, a lot of facility type things we need to take care of. This, that group doesn't exist. I mean, it's me uh, and somebody, no one else uh, at that point. So, so I still need to get my arms around it. Uh, I'm not scared, uh, but uh, it, it, <laughs> I got a snake of suspicion. I'll probably be coming back to this table in July 
and probably asking for a different uh, a different uh, set of cards uh, from a personnel piece. And you should. Thank you. Aaron? Because I want to follow up on Gus, you said facilities. Now, are you talking facilities maintenance, or what do you mean by that? Well, in, in a facilities program, there's there's the first level where it's, hey, just make sure the doors work and make sure the lights are working, that type of thing. Then there's, there's a hierarchy of, uh, of now, hey, let's do some long term, medium to long term planning. The medium stuff is, uh, hey, I know I need to do some inspections in here that will lead to long term things. Long term things is, hey, 20 year roof replacement. Uh, maybe medium stuff is five year whole, whole building painting. Uh, that type of thing. Uh, the other aspects I like to incorporate is I know we're, we're broken up in business lines. The business lines is we got waters, uh, I'm about to say it, it's, okay, it's not wastewater, it's stormwater, sorry. Uh, stormwater and uh, streets, streets or roads, um, and uh, associated parks that go with it. I'm going to stick within those business lines. But from a facilities perspective, is hey, it, it's all about. Hey, whether it's a pump in a well or it's the roof for the well, uh, yes, it's coming from a different funding stream, but it's all, to me, it's all capital improvement type items. Uh, a lot of actions that have to come together are more or less the same. The funding stream may be slightly different, and I don't be significantly different if it's coming from stormwater, but th those, I want to capture all those in, in one grand aspect. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying it clearly, but all those have to be accounted for. Um,